Today on Beer with Stevie Investigates, we're going to challenge the idea that DI resin really purges undesirable contaminants at or near its end of life, meaning that you can expect to see double or more of the ammonia and silica, and at the end, give away something cool. Hi, I'm Ryan, your host of Beerus TV Investigates, a weekly YouTube series which explores popular reefing theories, products, methods, what the manuals are missing, with a focus on putting them to the test, and then rate that theory based on our scale of reef fantasy to reef certainty. This week we're looking at the purging effects of DI resin, meaning when DI resin nears its end of life, it doesn't just let any old TDS through first. It might seem like once DI resin is depleted, it would simply stop working, and the water passing through may just be similar to tap water. However, that's not the case. The water leaving a nearly depleted or depleted resin canister is actually going to purge high concentrations of whatever the resin has the least affinity for, which is often undesirable elements like ammonia and silica. At least that's the theory. However, at what concentrations, and does it even matter for our application in reefing? So that's what we're going to answer today. Does DI resin actually purge contaminants once it's been depleted? The reason this is worth taking a deeper look at and why we would do an Investigates video is because it's actually theorized that some of the more undesirable elements like ammonia and silica are the first to purge. Meaning when the TDS finally reads one or two TDS, it could very well not just be some meaningless mix of calcium and water hardness or traces of silica and ammonia, it may very well be almost completely ammonia or silica. For those of you that are wondering why this would be, this is the easiest explanation. Inside the resin cartridge, there are positively and negatively charged beads, often referred to as cation and anion resin, mixed together as a mix bed. The anion resin will remove negatively charged contaminants like silica, nitrate, and phosphate. However, the anion resin has a stronger preference for some contaminants than others, meaning that it will release something like silica, which has a weak bond, if something with a stronger bond comes along like phosphate. For example, looking at three common contaminants, it has the weakest affinity for silica, followed by nitrate, and the strongest affinity for phosphate of those three ions. Meaning while the resin will remove silica, if nitrate follows, it will release the silica for a preference of nitrate, and if phosphate follows, it will release the nitrate for a preference of phosphate. Net result of that is the cartridge will eventually stratify, meaning that even though it's not something that you can see or easily measure, there will be a band of silica at the top, followed by a layer of nitrate, followed by a layer of phosphate. These bands will expand as the resin depletes until it reaches the top of the cartridge. At that point, in this example, nitrate would push the silica off the resin and high concentrations of silica will be released into the product water. This is why the general recommendation is to change the media an inch or so before it exhausts and not wait until the TDS meter is reading more than one. So this is what we're testing today, partially because the two elements which are very likely to go first and relevant to the reef aquarium is a relatively weak affinity cation resin has for ammonia and anion resin's weak affinity for silica. Not something that any reefer is going to want to start off with when mixing fresh salt water replacing evaporated water. So we're going to perform two tests. The first will be using the standard blue bulk mix bed resin and test for silica until complete exhaustion. We'll be using the blue mix bed because the color changing dye is in the anion resin, which is going to give us the best visual reference to anion exhaustion and silica performance. We're going to pump straight tap water through it at 200 milliliters a minute, which is about the same contact time and flow rate as a 75 gallon per day membrane, and then measure silica levels all the way past depletion. Then we'll do the same with the Purple Pro series mix bed resin and ammonia. The Purple Pro mix bed resin in this case because it has the cation dyed purple and will give the best visual reference for cation and related ammonia performance. Jumping straight to the results, our tap water had an average of 11.36 parts per million silica and you can see for the first eight hours or about 50% of visual depletion, the mix bed resin is removing a vast majority of the silica. However, at 75% depletion, we're seeing two parts per million silica. It's valuable to note that a TDS meter won't pick up this two parts per million because at a pH of 7 inside the cartridge, the silica is likely in a form which doesn't have an electrical charge and not measurable by a TDS meter. Now at 100% depletion and a full color change, the effluent of the DI resin is 26.1 parts per million silica and double that of tap water. So that leaves a little question. The resin absolutely did purge the silica off in preference for another stronger affinity contaminant. Then two hours after that, it did begin its descent back down. Note it's likely that we didn't capture the exact peak and there was likely a point where the silica levels were substantially higher. 
Now, some of you are probably disappointed to see that the deionization resin may allow some contaminants before complete depletion, and even more disappointed that a TDS meter may not pick it up, but that's just the nature of how all this works. That said, there are solutions that we'll get to at the end of this experiment. Next, looking at the ammonia performance, which averaged just under one at 0.92 parts per million. In this case, you can see the resin removed virtually all the ammonia, all the way up to about 80% visual depletion, which started to allow 0.23 parts per million ammonia to pass through. Then at 100%, 1.12 parts per million, and just after that, 1.92, and all the way up to 2.42 parts per million, which is much higher than the 0.92 before it starts to drop back down. So again, we're seeing some amount of ammonia leak towards the end of life, but lower than silica, and maybe in a form that a TDS meter wouldn't pick up again. So again, seeing a pretty significant purge at the end of life. There's little doubt that the common explanations of how ion exchange DI resins work is happening here in a measurable manner. In terms of ranking this from reef fantasy to reef certainty, I'm gonna rank this one a rare 10 out of 10, and it is a reef certainty that DI resin will absolutely purge the ions that it has the weakest affinity for at the end of life. So what does that mean to reefers in their tanks? Well, it's never a good idea to run a filter past its complete exhaustion point. Best practice is always to replace a filter while it's still functioning as intended to maintain consistent performance and related results. It's also worthwhile to note that the one to five TDS coming out of your RO membrane is a variety of contaminants. If you take your DI resin past its usable life, the corresponding one to five coming out of your DI resin is likely a concentration of specific elements, many of which are fairly undesirable in a reef tank. In that spirit, I think the color change in the resin may actually be a better tool for filter changeouts than a TDS meter because the color change allows you to change it before the end of life rather than after the contaminants are already leaking into your product water. TDS meters are still the best tool to monitor overall system performance in a more definitive manner. In relation to the silica and ammonia which was seen in the water before the depletion or leak through, we selected these elements on purpose because they're not just amongst the first to purge, but also the hardest for the DI resin to remove in the first place. There are some specialty resins out there that will remove these elements and create a permanent bond and at face value they may seem attractive, but most are prohibitively expensive and it's very difficult to know when they're depleted because there isn't a color change. And while they do make you feel good about that one element, it's just a few of a vast array of contaminants. I personally find the specialty silica or ammonia buster or eliminator type resins to be more of a marketing gimmick to reefers than anything else. I have two alternative options which are both much simpler, have clear indications of depletion, work on a wider array of contaminants, and even better, lower cost as well. The first is a simple two-stage DI. Like most filters, DI cartridge performance increases with contact time. Longer the contact time, the better the performance. With a dual-stage DI, you just run the first canister to depletion. When it's exhausted, replace it with a new one. The benefit here is with a single DI, you start with a full 10 inches of fully charged resin and related contact time. But towards the end, you may only have an inch or two of fully charged resin, and performance on the hardest to remove elements will go down with that especially because there's a higher concentration of the hardest to remove, weakest bonds at the top. With the dual stage DI, you'll always have a full 10 inches of DI resin in that second canister. In fact, during filter changes, most reefers will move the second slightly used filter to the first canister and put the brand new one in the second for best performance. There's just a lot of upside to running dual DI canisters, and for many reefers, this will almost completely solve issues of any undesirable contaminants leaking through prematurely. If you run a single now, you can just add another single on the end. Or if you want, you can pick up a canister and a dual bracket to make your own all-in-one dual. There's also a third option which provides near ideal performance on the widest array of contaminants and the most economical DI solution. That's a triple stage where rather than only using mixed bed resin, reefers can use a full cartridge of cation resin to remove all of the positively charged contaminants, a full canister of anion resin to remove all the negatively charged contaminants, and then a mixed bed at the end for a final polish. There are a few distinct reasons why this is the best option. First, many of the hardest to remove contaminants are pH dependent. For instance, at a low pH, silica will be in a form that has no electrical charge, meaning the DI resin will not be able to remove it. Conversely to that, at a high pH, most of the ammonia will be in a form with no charge as well, and the DI resin will not work in that case either, letting almost all of it through. 
separating the resin solves some of that because the water passing through the cation resin first will have a very low pH of around 3 where ammonia is much easier to remove. And then the water passing through the anion resin not only has a much higher pH but also has a concentration of hydroxides which makes it easier to remove the silica. The mixed bed after has a neutral pH of around 7 and the mixed beads perform like millions of tiny little single beds mixed together as the final polish. There's really no way around it. The three-stage approach addresses the widest array of contaminants, particularly those that are harder to deal with, and produces the highest quality water, really allowing you to not have to be concerned about any of this. I think it's also valuable to note that all three stages are color changing as well, so you can easily identify when to change out each one, which is much easier than other solutions. And related to that, you only need to change out the resin, which has actually been depleted, which leads to less waste, lower cost, much lower maintenance, or a fraction of the filter changeouts. Most reefers can upgrade their system to this design by just adding a single or dual canister DI to the end of their system. And outside of the system performance benefits, it will likely pay for itself with more efficient use of DI. That wraps up today's investigation, but in the next one, we're going to take a deeper look at which filters are actually capable of removing ammonia in our RO systems. I have to tell you, there is a lot of assumptions and inaccurate information floating around out there. I know this topic is a bit geeky, but the deeper we dive into these topics, the better the results will be. I can tell you, I think RODI for use on a reef tank is on the cusp of an evolutionary leap in terms of how the community uses these systems to achieve affordable, realistic results rather than just blanket claims. As always, we're giving away something cool this week with three of you winning a triple DI saver add-on kit which can upgrade your system to the type of system performance that we were just talking about for free. So hit that link in the lower left or head on over to the site, click on the specials and deals tabs, and then free stuff to sign up. If you like what we're doing, let us know with a quick thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because we release new reefing videos every week. See you next week with another Beerus TV Investigates where we continue the conversation on aquarium added purity. Is a bag of pickling lime just as good as a bag of Kelkwasser?